Hi, I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. But before we get started, head over to my website, kalilareynolds.com to subscribe to our newsletter. You can click the link up here or in the description box below. Now, come on, let's get this money. First up, digital music streaming giant Spotify is now available in Jamaica and the Caribbean. How important is this streaming platform in an already competitive music industry? And how can you use it to monetize your own music, podcasts, and more? We'll sit down with popular Jamaican recording artist Leela I.K. and music marketer, producer, and host of World Music Views, Donovan Watkiss. And later, the analysts swing on the latest market developments. Grace Kennedy Group is reporting that it achieved exceptional growth in revenue last year. And the Jamaica Broilers Group is also reporting an increase in profit for their third quarter last year. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark opened the budget debate in Parliament on Tuesday afternoon, further outlining how the government intends to fund and spend the $831 billion it has put forward in the estimates of expenditure for the upcoming fiscal year. More details on the debate will be provided in our Wednesday newsletter, as well as next week's What's Hot. Opposition spokesman on finance, planning and the public service, Julian Robinson, is expected to make his presentation on March 11, while opposition leader Mark Golding will speak on March 16. Prime Minister Andrew Holness will make his contribution on March 18, before Dr. Clark closes the debate on March 23. The Jamaica Stock Exchange, JSC, said it has noted the concerns of a Sibony Group Limited and continues to investigate the matter. There have been talks about a reverse takeover of the company, which now operates as a shell company owned by Finsac. The speculation may have led to the recent hike in share price. The company's stock, which ended 2020 around 22 cents, jumped to as high as $2.13 on February 25, 2021. However, no confirmation of such an arrangement has been given. In a statement released late last month, Sibane said they were not in possession of any material information that would have contributed to the recent trading levels in the company's shares and are also not aware of a reverse takeover. Sibane's share price tumbled last week in a dramatic reversal that reportedly triggered the JSC's circuit breaker. The JSC on Friday said they have escalated the issue to their service provider. The government has signaled its intention to start vaccinating Jamaicans against COVID-19 this week, with the first shipment of vaccines arriving on the island on Monday, March 8. The shipment of 50,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine was donated by India and was originally scheduled to arrive last week, Thursday. Healthcare workers and persons 60 years and older are first in line to get access to the vaccines. Other priority groups to be included as more stocks arrive are the Security Forces, Staff at Customs, PICA, the Department of Correctional Services, Schools, and Critical Public Sector Workers. Government officials will be vaccinated after these priority groups. In the U.S., financial technology company Square Inc. has reached an agreement to acquire majority ownership of music streaming service Tidal, which is partly owned by Jay-Z. Square will pay close to $300 million U.S. in cash and stock for Tidal under the deal. Jay-Z will also be named to Square's board of directors. He and other artists who currently own shares in Tidal will remain stakeholders. Tidal will operate as a distinct entity alongside Square, the payments company founded by Jack Dorsey. Dorsey is also co-founder and CEO of Twitter. In a statement, Jay-Z said the partnership will be a game-changer for many. Back on local shores, Kingston Properties Limited will be buying back about 3 million of its shares over the next two years. In a notice on the Jamaica Stock Exchange's website last week, the company said its share repurchases will be financed from cash flows and conducted on the open market through the company's stockbrokers. The price for the acquisition of the shares will be the market price at the time of repurchase. The company, which trades as KP Reed, currently has over 677 million ordinary shares in issue on the market. 
This puts their value at $4.9 billion. The announcement comes shortly after KP REIT stockholders approved plans for an additional public offer APO. Stay tuned for the analysts' take on these developments. Jamaica National Group is set to establish JN Bank in the Cayman Islands. CEO Earl Jarrett told shareholders at the group's recent AGM that the company has had discussions with Cayman authorities about changing its business model in the country from a building society to a commercial bank. He said a commercial banking license would enable the group to increase the deposit and loan portfolios, grow the JN brand, and support the expansion of the remittance business through correspondent banking. Last year, the group launched JN Bank in the United Kingdom. Carbon Assurance Brokers has gone digital and is now focusing on e-commerce with a suite of new digitized products. The company was forced to pivot due to the pandemic. Among the additions to its product line are International Insurance and Credit Union New Health Plan. This plan offers local health insurance to credit union members through the Jamaica Cooperative Credit Union League. The brokerage firm, which went public early last year, has also developed a new website, increased its social media presence, and has changed the method of operations to virtual meetings and presentations for both internal and external meetings. And e-commerce company WePay Jamaica has appointed former Deputy Governor of the Bank of Jamaica Livingstone Morrison to its Board of Directors. The announcement was made over the weekend. CEO and founder of WePay Alden Wayne said Morrison will be crucial in offering regulatory guidance and insight as the company works towards reshaping the financial landscape of the region. He said Morrison's understanding of the regulatory framework will assist WePay to achieve its long-term vision of financial inclusion and a connected Caribbean. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. When we come back with stage shows and tours cancelled, artists have had to find different ways to connect with audiences all over the world and earn a living. Streaming platforms like Spotify, which is finally available in the Caribbean, have taken on renewed importance, but does this have implications for artists who aren't already a household name? This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, insurance made easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Welcome back to Taking Stock. Spotify has announced an audience network which will accommodate cross-advertising between music and podcasts. Now, this is welcome news for the creative industry in the Caribbean, as many people are developing intellectual property specific to niche audiences. But how will this affect artists who, as we say in Jamaica, no boss yet? Joining us now to discuss, we have popular Jamaican recording artist Leela Ike and music marketer, producer, and host of World Music Views, Donovan Watkiss. Hi, Donovan. Hi, Leela. How are you guys doing? Yo, 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 yo. I'm well. What's up? Yeah, so I know, I I know, awesome. that, I know the yeah. artist life, Leela, will drag you out of bed for this interview, man. Hush. <laughs> sure. <laughs> But this is a really important topic. Uh, we're talking about getting paid, artists getting paid. It's, it's been a long-standing issue in terms of how you get paid for your music, especially if you're a young emerging artist like yourself. Well, you, you have you, your bus already, so, so you're good. But people who are just trying to get that bus and trying to get their music out there. So Spotify is now here in the Caribbean, finally, and JR, I want you to give us the background on what this means for the industry and for artists here in the Caribbean. So uh, thanks for having me, Kalila. Hi, Lila. I Hello. have been trying to get Spotify in Jamaica for a long time. I've advocated for it. I spoke to a lot of people and I started a TV show, which was in an effort to encourage them to come here. World Music Views actually it was bringing Spotify numbers in Jamaica for the last four years, from 2018, every week, World Music Views during ER brought the Spotify numbers. We had conferences, we had many meetings, but Spotify just saw it fit to put their platform in the Caribbean, which is really just moving the geotag because all the music that Caribbean artists made was already on Spotify. It's just that now 
the core audience, the, the reggae dancehall audience that resides in the Caribbean and, and most of the English speaking Caribbean because the Spanish speaking Caribbean all, always had Spotify, Dominican Republic, they had Spotify a long time. They had their own charts, matter of fact. But we can now in Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, all these countries and Africa, which is another core market for reggae dancehall people and other people who make music in Jamaica and the Caribbean, they can now stream the music on Spotify and other platforms. So the primary difference, like you're saying, is with the audience, meaning that Jamaican Caribbean artists could already monetize on Spotify even before this? Oh yeah, definitely. The, the, in fact, the, the audience reach that they now capture in Jamaica cannot be the all the withal for artists. They do need the US market, they need the England market, they need the Japan market, they need all these markets to really make a dent on the billboard charts through Spotify. Spotify does operate at a higher level than most other, other platforms. They pay more um, in terms of how many people are on it and the reach. Tidal is one of the highest paying platforms, but they have less subscribers. Spotify has like, they're going for a billion subscribers, they say, with these 80 plus markets that they expanded to. And that will make them the biggest audio platform in the world for streaming. Of course, they have a competitor called YouTube, which I believe is where this program is. But YouTube is yes. a video platform with a minor in, in audio. But Spotify is full on audio. But, and more than artists, podcasters and other content makers who make audio will benefit more from Spotify by creating niche content for these little areas. Um, your program will do well on Spotify if you have an audio version. Other people who have niche content specific to smaller demographics will have success on Spotify because they also have a thing called audience network where they'll get the ads for you and you can cross advertise. And there are a couple of other ways where they'll help you to monetize even without local advertisers coming in, they'll help you to monetize. And, and one other thing I want to say in terms of podcasters, Spotify pays more to podcasters than artists. They pay oh. Joe Rogan $100 million. They don't pay no other artists that money. Oh, so, they, so they also do deals with individual people. So paying Joe Rogan $100 million, that means it, it, that's what they specifically paid him. That didn't come through advertising. They just wanted him on their platform. Yeah, but they're going to make by that money from advertising because now... Joe Rogan has his podcast podcast exclusively on Spotify, both video and audio. So before it was on YouTube, Joe Rogan was making $100 million, allegedly, on these other platforms. But now Spotify gave him an advance of $100 million. And they have other, other content on there, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, a couple other content that, that will curate an audience. And if you make content that's similar... You can you can benefit from that audience because it's like a marketplace, you know. It's like, it's that, like you said imagine that video and audio. I thought Spotify was audio only. I they also have audio. They also have audio. Oh, and you know, I've never used it. I need to go to go check it out. But let's bring Leela in here. So Leela, you have been a breakout artist of what 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 year was your boss? Was it 2020 or 2019? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. <laughs> I'm just making music, but um, yeah. I'd probably say 2019 is when I've traveled the most um, in my career. So I did a lot of really um, huge shows like Rotterdam, Reggae Jam, all at prime time. So maybe that year is the most. Right, right. So I also did some fest that year too. Mm. Yes, I saw you at some fest. You're really good. I'm, I'm so impressed with you know how the soul that is in your voice and in your music. Like I tell people, I, this this young lady sounds like she's had her heart broken a million times. <laughs> 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 yeah, you, you definitely captured our imaginations. You've captured a, a, a large audience just through your talent. But tell me, before 2019, when you were you know, a younger artist trying to make it, trying to get out there, how difficult is it for you to make that breakthrough? Um, I think 
I think I was fortunate enough to be able to work with a team um, like Protege where getting a song recorded and, and getting it out there wasn't as hard because I I had the, the, the opportunity to use his platform and everything else that comes with working with his label. And him being an already established artist, it kind of brought me into spaces where, you know, he would have already created a, a relationship. Um, I think the hardest part of, of being an artist is, is really, you know, getting discovered on like a global scale. You know, it's getting discovered by different people in different countries. And I guess that's where streaming platforms come into play because you just put the music out there and kind of hope that people are into it and, and, and people can get on board. So I really feel like it's, it's visibility and all of that. But as it relates to the struggle of creating the music and, and getting it out there, I wouldn't say it was an extremely hard process. Prior to meeting Protégé, I wasn't even actually thinking about becoming an artist. I was just making music with a couple of my friends, going to different um, uh, different jam sessions, karaoke, wherever it was. But I was doing all of that out of love. But I guess over the years, I have actually been working pretty hard on, on, on becoming you know, the, the artist and performer that I am right now. How are you introduced to Protégé? Um, when I was in high school, I have a friend that uh, we went to high school together. We started in um, second form and we're still um, really good friends now. She kind of started trying to get me into Protégé's music when we were in high school. But I was pretty much an old school kind of girl, so I was listening the older reggae, you know, I'm still listening to Sizzla and Garnet Silk and Berries and all of that. Um, she moved on to university here in Kingston and she started working as an intern for Protégé. And now she's officially, um, you know, working with Indie Collective. So she has been speaking to him about me. Um, I didn't move to Kingston until uh, like two and a half years after she left for university because I was studying in Mandeville. And then, you know, in coming here, I attended his album launch for Ancient Future that she had invited me to, and she introduced us there. But we didn't really connect right there and then. It was more of a, you know, just a brief meeting. I explained to him that, you know, because I, I didn't want to just be like, oh, yeah, I'm an artist. You should work together just because he's, you know, working with my friend. I kind of like to just allow life to play things out. But I met him there and then a couple of years, not a couple of years, but like one and a half year later, he reached out to me because he was seeing and hearing about me through different spaces like Jamnesia. <clears throat> Jamnesia and all those spaces that I would go and, and perform. It was becoming, you know, I was becoming very popular in the, in the reggae community. And so he reached out, told me that he heard something and he'd love for us to work together. So business wise, it has been it hasn't been as difficult for you as it may have been for some other artists trying to, to establish a platform to get heard. But like you said, the international audience is where it's at. So you make your bus, your bus in Jamaica, but now you have to well, you have already, I guess, to some extent bus abroad, but but there are different levels of a bus, right? What has the past year been like for you? So 2019 you would have done a lot of tours, it got a lot a lot of international exposure, but then came COVID-19 and that just shut down. Yeah, definitely COVID-19 kind of shift the focus from, you know, touring and pushing the music through that to, you know, being more visible um, online. So uh, I released my first project last year and it was a bit disappointing to not be able to perform the songs on there's some really cool shows that I was booked for that we weren't able to do um, in Europe and America. Me, Protege, and Seven actually we were supposed to tour um, England. It was, you know, a very, very disappointing to not be able to go out and push the music that way, which is the way that I feel like most artists, that's what you look forward to the most. You know, you're in studio, you're recording. Everybody kind of wants to get on the stage and be able to 
you know, just get in their element and sing and everything. But um, we've had to create, you know, more different ways for the music to reach people. And I guess that's where platforms such as Spotify and all of these streaming platforms came in, you know, you know, encouraging people to go stream the album, you know, encouraging people to share it and all of that, doing a lot of live um getting on my instagram and doing lives that's how i i i actually um that's that's how i did my my album launch i i went on my live and had different artists come through that way i could get their fan base on board in listening to the songs and you know hoping that it would connect and people would go on to go and stream it and all of that it was just a very different way to go about it not my favorite way because it means that i have to be on my phone 24 7 and online 24 7 but i guess we're kind of advancing technologically and we kind of have a move with the time talk to me a little bit about the business and the leela because i know touring is how a lot of artists make a significant part of your income so you get paid to do shows and so on and if you don't have that how, how severely does that impact your ability to earn I feel like it really, it really, it's a huge impact if you don't have that part. If it is that you haven't, you know, outside of music, have different income streams set up. Um, if you should look at the streaming platforms, you don't earn a lot from that, especially like how not everybody is, is, is into all of these other platforms like like um, Spotify and Tidal and, and, and all of that. Not a lot of your core, I guess my core audiences, not a lot of them necessarily tap into that. So um, for me, it boils down to the royalties. I feel like the songs that I've put out, put out over time, you know, I've begun to see, you know, the royalty checks coming in. Um, with YouTube, you know, with people watching the, the, the videos and all of that, YouTube being monetized, you get a, a, a certain level of income there. Um, there's also the sound system culture for me, which I think is, has definitely been a huge, um, it has created a huge um, income for me because when you do a dub plate, you know, a sound man pay you to do the dub plate, that money comes directly to me. So before a label and everybody, before, with, the, with the incomes, with the, um, sorry, with the streaming platforms and royalties and such, you know, there's a lot of people to be paid before it gets to me because it's the people that are involved in creating the music, the producers. We are now signed to a label, so they are also involved in, in, in getting out of all of that before it gets to me. But with the sound system and the dub plate culture and all of that, that money comes directly to me. So that has been a huge help also. And... Um, since COVID-19, I've done, I think, about four or five virtual shows. So, you know, pre-recorded shows that eventually go on different platforms and stream. And, you know, you're paid for the, those shows also. But you're paid differently because, you know, people are saying, well, it's not the real show. It's not the big show. So we have to kind of cut the costs and all of that to, to produce a show on this um, kind of style and platform. So... That's been how it has been, and I guess merchandise. Yeah, so you have to find different ways to monetize, to earn. Donovan, Leela made a point just now that before she gets paid on a platform, through a platform like Spotify, it has to go through so many different people who have to get paid before she does. And uh, she mentioned that you know Spotify and these platforms, streaming platforms don't pay that much. How much do they get paid? So Spotify pays 0 0.003 cents per streams. Um, however, it's to the master's owner, the person who owns the song. Exactly. So, so if Leela owned her songs, she would have gotten paid directly. Because so, that's the, the format mm -hmm. of music business is the money, majority of the money is made from the master recording, sync licensing, um, merchandise, as Leela said, dub play. But dub play is unique to reggae dancehall music. You don't find mm -hmm. a lot of dub plate in hip hop and, and so no, but, no. but I mean, you have like Wyclef who killed the dub plate um, sound system thing. But is that is something unique to the reggae dancer? Now, streaming, what these record labels do is make contracts and deals with the streaming companies. And if you notice, 
if Drake drop a song, it goes shoop, like streams go crazy. Because there are certain relationships that record labels can offer that independent artists can't offer, especially when the artist is, is part of the, the franchise of the record label. Walchi Fire explained to me in a few days ago in an interview that it was because of Coffee's alignment with a record label why she got help to win the Grammy. And he explained further that it's a boys club, etc. Streaming is no different. Um, record labels will have to make money. They'll find ways to make money. But more importantly, it's the person that owned the master recording. That's the person that will make the bulk of the money from streaming platforms. Artists will get their percentages based on whatever was worked out, how much of the song they own, uh, mechanical royalties, all of that. With well, that part of their split that was worked out. Um, Leela, as an up and coming artist, I'm sure she'll get to the point where she'll eventually own her masters and that money will but come sure. directly to you as you grow your business. Because music business, as I keep telling artists, it would be called music music if it wasn't a business, but it's called music business. Mm -hmm. And as you finish, as you do music and you grow in music, you get to the business because that's where your pension is. There's no money to be made from governmented music. The pension come from your lifetime royalties and, and payments from your legacy that you're making. Yeah, ab absolutely. Because we hear so many stories about artists who, you know, people who are veterans in the industry. And then when they, unfortunately they pass away, they have to be having barbecue and, you know. And selling. it's not unique and, to Jamaica, you know. It's yeah, not unique to Jamaica. Last I, year, last year, penniless. Last, yeah, last year, the, the entire music industry made $43 billion, 43 billion US. You know how much of that went to artists? 12%. 12, 1, 2. 12 percent because music is now turned into paper uh, this is taking stock so you know about turning securities mm -hmm. and all that the, mm -hmm. the, the master recordings is turned into paper um and they have, they have this new thing now called stu i believe it's a securities paper where you can if if leela for example owned all her masters she could go to a a, a broker or somebody who is in investment and they'll actually pay her for her master recordings and, and if you notice, a lot of people are selling their master recordings. Shakira sold hers recently for $100 million. Lil Wayne sold his because that's where the power is. How much future earnings will come in on those masters actually will have a value right now. And people will pay for that. People invest in that just like they invest in any other company. Yeah. Leela, you strike me as a very intelligent young lady. How involved are you in the business end of your career? Um, you know, say from, from the beginning of working with Protege, he has, you know, spoken to me about a lot of things. Like he sat me down, he explained to me what it is, you know, what it means to own my master's, how I go about owning my master's, like... So I've had the opportunity to speak to him about different things. And, you know, we're always having like a refresher conversations about different changes in the market and, and how things are working. And even when we were getting signed, it wasn't a case where he just went and accepted the deal. You know, he, he spoke to both of us, explained to us how it is that we'd be earning now that, you know, there's another person involved in it and, you know, just the opportunities that would come from signing the label and also just the pros and cons. So, yeah, I do have an idea of, 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 of how it is that I'm earning. And because I know that, you know, unless you're, you're really, I'd have to be getting like billions of streams for me to really be, earning and and as him as he said oh i'd have to be owning my masters and all of that right now to be truly earning through streaming and all of that on a massive scale i just kind of you know on my own develop different ways of how i can use my brand to make music for to, to make money for me because i think the greatest part of, of all of this is outside of the music yeah I'm making really good music and maybe later later down the line is when i'll really begin to to earn the big bucks through the songs themselves but for right now what i do have is you know youthfulness and and a brand that i can use to to to, to make money elsewhere 
you know so that's what i've been thinking about yeah do you find that a lot of especially the younger artists just just excited to be making music that they don't really pay enough attention to the business end 100% i do think so and i think a lot of people a lot of young people pay attention to what they are able to make no so i find i find i feel like especially in the dance hall community it's kind of like a quick crop um what them call it a cash crop or whatever situation for them they're not necessarily investing in creating a brand or getting proper management or learning about the business it's more like if i put out a song right now and it's trending i can go to a party and you know, they might go pay me if you come pull up at that show, yeah, and work. I can't, you know, the whole dub play thing. I don't think a lot of them are really and truly, sorry, <clears throat> investing in understanding how the business work and the, long the longevity of, of what creating a really great brand can do for them down the line, you know. And I actually don't, I don't think it's such a really bad idea. Because really and truly it boils down to what your vision and your goal is. If it is that you're here right now and you're, you're young and you're fresh and you're popping and you just want to grab as much as you can right now, that's good. But I don't think it's 100% smart. But I guess from your earning one way or another, it's what works for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you, you've given us a lot to, to consider, especially for those who are coming up in the business and want to be where you are right now and beyond so Donovan, coming back to, to Spotify, for an artist who has their music, they're independent right now, they're not signed to any label, they're just trying to get their music out there. How do you get your music on a, a major streaming platform like that? It's uh, several ways. You can be an independent artist. If you don't own the music, you can't put it up. Because again, it's the person who owns the masters, person who owns the music that can distribute it and get it distributed. Um, but you can start your own label. You can you can get some artists and produce some songs. Uh, my son is ten and he's producing music. Like I'm teaching him. I didn't teach him. Let me take that back. He started doing it, and I, I started supporting him. Um, these kids are making music. Uh, but I want to add some to to what Leela said and explain further how music gets on platforms. Jamaica's winning edge is culture. Like our cultural capital is what most artists are measured by in terms of even record labels signing them. The, the head of RCA said that when he signed um, Coffee, and I think Lila was a part of that too, he said that it was a base, based on cultural capital. It was based on the, the diaspora and how enthusiastic they are about that audience and the value of reggae music for revolution and change and of course the legacy of Bob Marley there's a halo effect happening over reggae music so when you do quality reggae music it's an advertisement for the culture not just the artist so when an artist enters the reggae space he or she benefits from that reggae dancehall space now the bigger the space the bigger the artist can be the artist can become bigger than in space if him do that, he must go exist in another space. And we see where artists start in reggae, go out, and don't manage to keep that cultural capital, so they end up with one hit, and they become a one-hit wonder. There are several artists that, that sell millions of records that come from Jamaica, and they have not managed to capitalize on the culture. Leela, her songs are rootsy, her songs are groovy. There are many other artists that speak as a voice of the people. Now, turning that, turning culture into money is the difference between an artist who lasts long and an artist who will just be temporary. And monetizing that means understanding what people want. As Lila said, create a brand. Shirt, pants, clothes. Like People are into lifestyle music. Mm -hmm. Whatever resonates with them, they'll follow it from now till forever. So it's not just streaming that you, you got to make the money from. As an artist, if you make quality songs and you're speaking on behalf of people, they're not just going to want your music. They're going to even want a pen with your name on it. They're going to want to wear the shoes. That yeah, merchandise. merchandise. And yeah. spoke to it, having merchandise. All of that, yeah. How can people get your merchandise, by the way, Leela? Where is it available? Well, right now we have the, the In Bloom. Well, it's called Still Blooming now. The merchandise, it's on Protégé's um, 
uh, website. It's it's at shopprotege.com. You can get these shirts. You know, it's a collab. It's me and Protege's song on his album. We did we launch. We did a remix of the song and launched it with um, merch. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have my merch too. Let's get this money. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I have my shirts. So I have shirts on my. So if you guys want to yeah. check it out, KalilaReynolds.com. And as you <laughs> as you capitalizing on the cultural capital of money, which Absolutely. is the greatest story in the world. Reggae music is one of the greatest stories ever told. And that's what you got to capitalize on. Not just you being an artist, you know. You being an artist, you're using vibe. reggae as your vehicle. And, and to get music on Spotify or any platform, you just need an aggregator. Um, you can distribute it yourself. So an aggregator is, a, is a, somebody that works as a middleman to get your music on these platforms. And, and they'll pay the oh, aggregator. So there's Zodrak, there's Zodiac Johnny Wanda, there's me. There is, there is any anybody that understands how to to distribute music. My podcast, should, a podcast. I should link you to get it on Spotify. Yeah, man, easy, easy thing. I won't even charge you. You're my friend. I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 you don't have to pay the regular twenty percent, which is what the <laughs> aggregators charge. Um, mm -hmm. But Spotify, my podcast is on thirteen different platforms with the click of a button. Um, this is not like weird. Like when I show you how to do it, you're gonna be like, oh my god, this is so easy. Um, but some persons go through aggregators because you need to administer your distribution and get your music different places and all of that. Um, but but that's just like one tiny part of the music business. But it's it's a lucrative business if you own your masters. If you own your music and you can get your music out there, you, you're doing some music in Kingston, according to Junior Gang. He said to me, say, yo, what's good about Spotify and these platforms is if you're in Kingston just doing some music with a click of a button, Everybody can gets the music. Yeah. You don't have to be pressing records. You say back in the days, and I'm part of this. You have to be pressing records. You have to carry it over there. So you have to ship it. You have to go through customs. Now you cut through all of that value added yeah. system. Press the click of a button. And if you own the music, all the money comes back to you and you pay the people who help and you to make the music. Of the beauty of the digital environment. I was telling some, some yeah. young people the same thing with starting a media business back in the day if you wanted to, to start a show that like i'm doing or, or launch a television station you have to invest in a broadcast tower which is a whole lot of money you need all this equipment, you, need all these, you need so many things now camera man an internet connection and boom you're up you're on i was YouTube looking at channel. i was looking at one of the modern tv stations that started and and he had to raise 30 million dollars in 2003 i started start my business company. with zero dollars there you go it's a different time it's the same for music same for anything you're doing if you want to do it you just need to get the information and put it out so taking stock is doing a good job with that thanks jr i think that's a good note to leave it on all right, all right thanks, guys up next we've got your market recap and the analysts are standing by this segment of taking stock was brought to you by bulwark insurance agency insurance made easy and massey united insurance how good is your insurance? Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange advanced, with the combined index gaining less than 1%. 102 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JC for the week ending Friday, March 5, 2021. 43 advanced, 48 declined, and 11 stayed the same. 108 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $614 million. Wigton Wind Farm traded the most, taking up nearly 24% of market volume. The stock lost 3 cents to open the week at 67 cents. Trans Jamaican Highway traded at the second highest, with people buying and selling 12 million shares in the company. The stock gained 5 cents to open the week at $1.38. And Derrimon Trading rounded out the most traded, taking up nearly 9% of market volume. The stock lost 2 cents to close last week at $2.54. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. I know what you're thinking. No, it's not Sibony Group who claimed the top spot last week, but G West Corporation Ordinary Shares. The stock rose 20% to open this new week at 90 cents. Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances gained 16% to close last week at $2.45.
And rounding off the biggest gains stock, Dolphin Cove advanced nearly 16% to open this week at $9.25. On the losing side now, after weeks of gains, Sibony Group fell nearly 61% to close last week at $0.64. Cents. In a statement released last week, the Jamaica Stock Exchange said concerns raised about Sibony have been noted and are being investigated. I Create Ordinary Shares fell 19% to end last week at $0.75 cents a share. Two companies tied last week for the third biggest losers. 138 Student Living Jamaica Variable Preference lost nearly 18% down to $4.20 and Everything Fresh also lost nearly 18% to open this week at $0.84. Cents. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think Wealth, Think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined by Senior Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services, Auric Angus, and Research and Strategy Analyst at Sagicor Investments, Jody Ann Aris. Hi, Auric. Hi, Jody Ann. Hi, Kalia. How are you? I'm good. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. So, we have... A little bit of news to discuss this week. There's always news on the stock market. It's always something that we need to follow, need to discuss. Let's start with Grace Kennedy Group, Auric. They're reporting exceptional growth in revenue last year. And we know GK is one of those companies that's in manufacturing and distribution heavily. That's the core of their business. So that should come as no surprise, right? Right. That's, that's very impressive. I mean, the company's revenue has been growing year on year. Um, revenue this year total around $115.4 billion, which is ahead of their 2022 target of $100 billion. So that's $15.4 billion ahead of the forecasted amount that the company had expected. That's very impressive. Um, the revenue, $91.4 billion of that amount was just from the company's food segment alone. Um, and that figure is really untouched by no other players in the market. GK has um, really, the strategy for 2020 has really been to, to threaten their supply chain. Um, there, there was a lot of strategic initiatives throughout the COVID pandemic that the company had adjusted to, to see these numbers. In terms of their bottom line, um, that grew at around 38 by approximately 38 percent um, revenue. Sorry, net profit to shareholders was roughly 6.2 billion dollars, which was a 1.7 dollar, 1.7 billion dollar increase in profit margins over the year. Um, the company's growth outlook for 2021 is really they're trying to continue with the efficiencies to manage costs as well as they're looking at strategic mergers and acquisition opportunities in the market. As you can see last year, they acquired Key Insurance Company um, and Canopy Insurance, which is also a, a, a upcoming um, player within the segment of, of Grace profit margins. So the company was, it, it has been very, the core revenue stream, all of them were up. Um, the the food, including financial services, that was up too. Grace, Grace Kennedy Financial Service, yeah, that was that was fairly good. I mean, they're really not where they want to be yet, and that's where most of the growth will be coming from um, in the coming years. Um, I expect to see that segment of the business um, really pushing for the revenue margins for the company for some time to come. So we shall see that. Um, in terms of, I see they, they announced that they plan to launch their first digital factory. Um, hopefully that should come out um, later this year into a next digital year. digital well. factory? Well, what's that? Yeah. Di a I, I don't know factory? exactly what the plans are for that, but that's what um, the CEO announced um, in, in, in um, a press release earlier this week. So I'm looking forward for more information on that. But yeah, I'm trying to figure out how a digital it. factory works because the, a factory makes things. So right. <laughs> are I mean, you going to put things online? Some, I don't know. <laughs> there will be some um, technological advanced segments to maybe their factory space or their produce um, to lessen costs and 
to less operating costs um, for the company and all of that. So I, as I say, I just want to see, to get more details on how they plan to, to let that work. And then I can I can provide more information on that. But so far um, today, the company stock price is up approximately forty percent, um, a PE ratio of fourteen times. A dividend. Wait, up forty percent in what period of time? Since when? In year to date. Year to date. Year to date. Wow. Yes. Yes. Um, it has a dividend yield of one point one point eight two percent, which is actually impressive. So. I mean, a shareholder is not only getting growth from, from the stock, but you're kind of enjoying the best of both worlds um, in terms of the dividend that the company paid out. I mean, last year they paid out around about $1.60 per share, which is around $1.5 billion um, in 2020. That was the highest um, dividend payout in the company's history. And, I, and I'm sure that as, as the profit margins continue to grow over time, that amount will increase. You know, So all looks good for Grace. Um, it's a recommended buy for me, hands down. So yeah, that's pretty see, much what we're looking at. Another M&D company, manufacturing distribution company that is performing well is Jamaica Broilers, Jody Ann. Oh. Yeah. Have you eaten that chicken, Jody? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Rollers definitely has shown some improved performance, particularly when you look at it from the hardest hit quarter would have been their Q4, which ended May in 2020. They had a big hit there, you know, just owing to the pandemic. And quarter on quarter, they have been improving. I think year over year, when you look at 20, the, the quarter ending January 2021 versus the quarter ending. January 2020, that's been an improving both revenues as well as net profit. Um, one of the things in Brawlers, though, is that they were having challenges prior to COVID-19. If you may recall that, you know, leading up into 2019, they are both they had issues with the, the segment in Haiti. And so they were facing challenges there, even though there was still some amount of buzz and anticipation for expansion in the U.S. market. So they had their challenges. However, they still had some optimism associated with the company and the group leading into 2020. Um, but COVID, you know, kind of hit things, particularly on the Jamaica market segment where things are a little bit more tricky for them. But we see where they have been making improvements. And one of the things that Eric would have mentioned for Grace Kennedy, we also seen it for Jamaica broilers in that their, their margins have improved. So you're seeing where efficiency has improved and that's partially linked to, you know, you're going into a period of a pandemic and you decide, you know, hey, how we prepare for this? Let's see how best we can cut costs. And that would have returned, resulted in gains for most of these manufacturing companies that we're seeing. So year on year gross profits has improved as well as net profits. And that is good when you look for shareholders. So, I mean, for, for broilers, I mean, there's still some challenges with Haiti. I mean, there's still more that can be done in terms of the rebound locally with tourism still being out and schools and major events. I mean, so there's still more growth in the company to come once there's that sort of recovery that comes in a post-COVID era. So it is an opportunity to buy um, at, a, this, at a lower end, knowing that, you know, as we, the economy picks up steam and we return to more events and having more tourist arrivals, then that improvement in their performance will come. And you'll see a return in terms of that reflected in their stock price. Yeah. What does it say about the economy, Jodian, that Broilers is reporting this improved performance? Because for quite a number of Jamaican households, chicken is a luxury. Yeah, I mean, part of, part of it is also how it is that they, they would have streamlined and how it is that they would have worked through a pandemic. So, I mean, each company, I think at the start, we said it depends on your management and how it is that they're going to switch and make things in a way that it becomes more accessible or it becomes easier for persons to want to, to demand or to receive. So it, it, it links to how it is that as a company, you, you fashion and you pivot during a period of, as such. So I mean, for a company like Broilers, they would have lost, you know, schools and as well as, errors in tourism but there's also strength when you look at the december period in that persons would have looked at things in a different way so maybe you're not going out to eat but persons would have thought to say let us still have some amount of christmas in some ways and you would have seen different eras in houses that persons would have refashioned 
how it is that they would normally have done things and that would have helped. So there are still periods in the economy where we're still facing lags, where a person's demand is down, the earning power is down, but there are other periods where there, there, there are other segments where persons are still trying to hustle and still trying to find a way to make it and you know have some sense of normalcy. And as such, you would say where persons would possibly prepare things in a different way, in smaller packages, in a much more with probably affordable way. And as such, borrowers would benefit in that regard. So even though there are pockets of the economy that are still struggling, there are still areas that have been seen a pickup. So when it is that the government is able to open and have, you know, because in December period, we'd have had a curfew that would have been a little bit longer than what we're facing now. We should have lent or given allowance for a little bit more activity for persons to probably pick up a, a extra job. You know, if it is that companies that may have closed segments, they, you know, they kind of opened up a little bit more and they were able to allow for persons to probably work a little few extra hours or to take on a staff that they would have probably recently let go. So, so you know, it's a picking up period, as you saw, for the economy. And that is reflected in the look at the Q4 results or the Q3 results in this case. Yeah, yeah. So I see that there is news on the APO front as well. The APO has been the latest trend that companies have been taking up to, to raise additional capital. Who's looking towards an APO now, Auric? Well, um, Kingston Properties um, announced, well, they didn't give details on any um, dates regarding their APO, but we do know that there is one in the pipeline. They also um, announced a share buyback program, which the company has been on for the past seven years or so. Um, the, the, the real aim of the, the share buyback is really to boost um, earnings per share. I mean, the company has cash on hand. They might want to use up some of their liquidity to buy back some of those shares. Uh, what's kind of contradicting, well, what was contradicting to me before I read the article was um, pe many people are asking, the company is buying back shares, but yet still they're issuing an APO. You're taking shares from the market, then issuing shares back on the market. I think what happened, and as the company um, CEO announced that they're not planning on doing them simultaneously, so the share buyback program might not be um, might not happen during the same time that APO is is taking place. So it's all about timing of those two different um, programs that the company is venturing into right now, um, but. That, which one uh, which one does it make sense to do first the share buyback i think it would make would, sense to do the share buyback first i would do the, the share APL buyback later. first and then the apl at a later date um but like i said the company has been buying back shares um they have a share buyback program going on for since 2014 um and they continue to do that um as we speak so i think uh, the next share buyback program that they're announcing right now is to acquire up to three million units um at our own i didn't i don't remember the price but that's the plan to be honest yeah all right well i think that's it for this week uh yeah. Julianne, auric short and sweet good points to raise yeah. we're gonna have a lot to discuss for the next week because the budget debate uh right. will be coming around Looking forward we'll to start, that. right right so we'll have a lot to discuss with you guys and the other analysts starting next week thanks no for joining problem. me you're welcome thanks for having me this segment of Taking Stock with the Analysts was brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel and share with a friend. Also subscribe to our newsletter at kalilareynolds.com and turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all my other features. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. This week on Money Mondays JA, have you ever wondered what causes stock prices to go up and down? There are actually several factors I'll explain. And on Money Moves JA, we have some tips for small businesses to remain financially viable as the pandemic drags on. Now follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow at Taking Stock JA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Also visit our website, kalilareynolds.com, for financial information you can use however you like it. Watch, listen, or read. 
Now tell a friend about taking stock. Investing is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>